The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'll say that again, and I'll make some physical gesticulations. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This was intended to show you that it is all about God. And what God does. Salvation is all about what God does for the person who thoroughly surrenders his or her life into God's hands. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100, verse 5 For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. Whether those generations are human or divine, if there is such a thing as a divine generation, truth endureth to all generations. In other words, as long as there is God. Finish my words. There's truth. Think as you listen. Isaiah one eighteen. come now and do what? Let us reason together. You see, God is a reasonable God. He has to be a reasonable God to invite us to reason. Satan is not reasonable. But God is reasonable. And so he invites us, come now, let us reason together. And as you do this, the Spirit of God will bless that mental activity. Let us pray. Father in heaven, give me the words. Give me the right attitude. Give me boldness and give me compassion. If I have offended you, forgive me, I pray. Use me, dear God, as I humble myself into your service and I offer no resistance. Use me as you see fit. Father, bless everyone under the sound of my voice. Bless them in areas they're not even aware they need to be blessed. Let this message touch someone, dear God. Remember our people in Ukraine, I pray first for members of the household of faith and then for the larger population suffering as a result of this invasion. Dear God, wherever your people are in difficult circumstances, be with them, Father, and sustain them as you sustain the Israelites in the wilderness. Again, I ask you, put your words in my mouth. If anyone listening to me is sick, bring relief, bring healing, particularly if that condition is COVID-19 or any of its variants. Hear this humble prayer, dear God. Bless this country. Bless the leaders. Remind them in all that they do of two things, Father. The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and righteousness exalteth a nation. Bless what you the Hills Academy, dear God, please. Let this school be the reason why multiplied thousands will be ready to meet Christ when he comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let's go back to Psalm 23. We read 1 to 3. Or well, let's read verse 3 for the sake of time. Psalm 23, verse 3. How many of you have the King James Version? Can I see? Uh, you can read with me if you like. What does verse 3 say? He what? 
He restoreth my soul. Come on. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Finish the verse. For you need not answer. Whatever they are, they're not sin because they're the paths of righteousness. But listen carefully. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not mine. Let's add a verse to that. Ezekiel 36. Let's read verse 27, our subject, for his purpose. Ezekiel 36, reading verse 27. I don't see a clock. Oh, there's that. All right, 749. When am I supposed to end? Where's Dr. Dean? Well, no, temperance in all things, especially preaching. Uh, let's see. 820, 825. You don't need to go beyond that. Okay, 30 and the extreme side. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? What does that say? And I will do what? Put my spirit within you. Now carefully read the next few words. And I will do what? Cause you to what? Walk how? In my statutes. Now read that verse microscopically. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. What do you understand by I will cause you to walk? Give me one word for walk in my statutes. One word. Obey. Mm -hmm. God bless you. God said I will cause you to obey. Now, go back to Psalm 23. Do you have that? Verse 3. He restoreth my soul. Read the second part. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Stop. The statutes of God in Ezekiel 36, 27 are the paths of righteousness in Psalm 23, verse 3. He leadeth in the paths of righteousness because I cannot lead myself in righteousness. Have I lost you? Are you with me? Why is it that I cannot lead myself in the paths of righteousness? Listen to this verse very carefully. Now you go there. Romans 8. Romans 8. Our subject for his purpose. Nothing I say tonight will be symbolic. I'm not preaching from Revelation or parts of Daniel or parts of Zechariah or Ezekiel. I'm preaching literally. What book did I say? Romans, what chapter? Eight, what verse? Seven, read microscopically. Don't sleep, read and concentrate. What does the Bible say? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Keep reading. For it indeed can be impossible. What is impossible? Obedience to God's law purely from the carnal nature. It is impossible. Then you can understand he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. The ability to obey God is the very presence of the power of God within. That's why Paul can say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, come on, I live, come on, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This was the experience for Christ himself. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the words. John 14 verse 10, Jesus says, all that I do is actually the work of the Father in me and through me. And you and I must be able to say like Paul, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm saying all of that to, sub to sustain the point, it is God who empowers us to obey. But look at Psalm 23 again. What's the final, what's the purpose of this obedience? Listen again. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness, finish the verse, for his name's sake. That's the end. That's the ultimate. His name's sake. Go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. We read 10 and 11. Our subject, for his purpose. Do you have Philippians? Adventists are called the people of the book. 
do we still deserve that title? Nobody answered the preacher. We do? Well, why are you still looking for Philippians 2? Have you found it? All right, verses 10 and 11. Before I read any more, let's pray again. Father, as I continue to address your beautiful sons and daughters, speak through me, dear God, please, for your glory, not mine. In Jesus' name, I appeal to you. Amen. Read verse 10. What does that say? Now, let's listen to one of the reasons Christ came to this earth. Go to John 17 quickly. We'll read verse 4. But let's read 3 and 4. We're so familiar with 3, but not quite often not quite as, as familiar with four. We read three and four. John 17. Beautiful book. Read John sometime. It was written by the disciple closest to Christ. And Eloi says of all the disciples, he most perfectly developed the character of Christ. So you're reading a, 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 a gospel written by someone very, very close to Christ. John 17, three and four. And this the work to be done, Jesus Christ glorified the Father. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> Jesus says, I have glorified you on the earth. Go to Matthew 5. Let's read from verse 14 of Matthew 5. Do you have that? Read for me nice and loud. What does that say? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Keep reading. Let your light. Pause, pause. Let what? Your light. So shine before men together and because you are reasoning let us come to a conclusion that can be defended theologically and logically he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness come on for his name's sake i will i will cause you to walk in my statutes i have glorified thee on the earth every tongue should confess jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. And I'll add one more. Whether therefore ye eat, come on, or drink, come on, or whatsoever ye do, finish the verse, do all to the glory of God. What have you observed? What is the ultimate purpose for anything you and I do? The glory of God. That's not symbolic. Now, why was Adam and Eve, or why was Adam made? Why was Eve made? Why are you made? Go to Isaiah 43. We've established firmly the glory of God must be our highest purpose in every single thing we do. And there are no exceptions. That's extreme, but it's also literal. Let me say it again. The glory of God must be our ultimate aim, and there are no exceptions. Whether therefore you eat or drink or study or take finals or buy a dress or buy a suit or pursue a romantic involvement, everything must ultimately be, finish my words, for the glory of God. What book did I send you to? What chapter? What verse? Seven. Read that for me, for I have... Come on, for I have created him, come on, for my glory. Stop. I have created him for my glory, not his. Conflict and Courage, page 21, paragraph 5, Ella White. How many of you are familiar with Ella White? Can I see how? Ah, oh, my heart is encouraged. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. well, well, let me not say what I'm about to say. Comfort and courage, page 21, paragraph 5. God created man for his own glory. That after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. You say, hmm, thanks for that. Do you understand why you're saying hmm? Listen again. God created man for his own glory. That after test and trial, referring to perfect Adam and perfect Eve being tested and tried. He might become one 
with the heavenly family. God's intention was to blend divinity with humanity and produce one creature. Now, can you imagine what that creature would be? A human being united with God. Have you ever heard of a liger? What is a liger? A cross between a lion and a tiger where the, the lion is the father. What is a tigon? A cross when the tiger is the father. All right. Now, here's a human being mixed with God. It doesn't make God less God, but it elevates that human being to a level only short of God. Is this mic working? Nobody said amen. The faith I live by, page 66, paragraph 2. Speaking of Lucifer, here's what Ellen White writes. God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible, like himself. In other words, here's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, equal in divinity, right under them was Lucifer. Listen to Ellen White. God made him good and beautiful as near as possible as himself. The only reason why Lucifer wasn't God is because God cannot be created. But Lucifer came as close to being God as any created being could be. We will take Lucifer's place. But before we occupy that position, we must practice it down here. What am I trying to say? You and I are on this earth to glorify God. That's why you're here. It is not to glorify you. I'm not here to glorify me. Your ultimate purpose, your single purpose is to glorify God. Go to Psalm 106. Now remember, nothing I'm saying is symbolic. It's two minutes after eight. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? What verse? Verse 3 of Psalm 106. By the way, Psalm does not really have chapters, but uh, it has divisions, just to be technical. Verse 3 of Psalm 106. Are you there? Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, you tighten your grip on my faculties, dear God, because the carnal nature is always trying to exalt itself. Suppress it, Father. In Jesus' name, I appeal to you. Amen. Blessed are they that keep judgment. Finish the verse. Come on, finish the verse. And he that doeth righteousness six days a week at all times. Now, what does that mean? Blessed are they that keep judgment. And he or she that doeth righteousness at all times. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We are called upon to glorify God at all times. That's why you and I are on this earth. That's why Christ came to glorify the Father, to represent the Father, that the world may see what the Father was like. He had other missions, of course, but that was central because, you see, as Adventists, we know the original charge against God was that his law could not be kept. The law was unfair. It could not be kept. When he led Adam and Eve to fall, he stuck a finger in God's face and said, see, your law cannot be kept. Jesus Christ came, and by his life, he proved what? That the law can be kept. But the Jewish system tells us this. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So while Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly, he is only one witness. We need at least a second to demonstrate the accuracy of God's claim his law can be kept. God has one witness, Jesus Christ. But how many Adams are there? Two. <laughs> two. You didn't have lunch, I understand that. There are two. The first and the second. 
The first messed up. The second came and redeemed the fall of the first. Now the first represented by us are to keep God's law as Jesus kept it. So that God will finally have what? Two witnesses. The church and Christ. Keeping God's law how? Perfectly. You are on this earth to help God prove the claim that his law can be kept perfectly. Let me say that negatively. You and I are on this earth to disprove the charge of Satan that God's law was unfair and cannot be kept. And so God pointed to Christ. Look. Satan said, well, I need another witness. That's your system. And God is waiting on us to do what Jesus did by the power of Christ. I say again, you and I are on this earth for the glory of God. Let's go to Romans 8. Let's see what Jesus did. He did for us and he wants to do in us. Romans chapter 8, we read from verse 1. Our subject, for his purpose. Do you have that? The Bible says, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. To them who are where? In Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. In your condition and mine, keep reading, condemned sin in the flesh. Meaning the possession of the carnal nature does not mean you and I have to sin. That the righteousness of the law might what? Finish verse 4. Be fulfilled where? In us. Where was it also fulfilled? In Christ. As Christ fulfilled the law in our condition. Surely, if we follow his method, we will fulfill the law as he did. Christ is waiting with longing anticipation for the reflection of himself in his church. Uh, Christ Object Lesson 691. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. When God made Adam and Eve, he made them in his image. Genesis 1.26, no need to go there. And God said, let us make man come on how? In our image, after our likeness. Now listen to a description of the image of God. Just listen. 1 John 3, 4, and 5. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. That's Christ. No sin. But the creator was Christ. Let me say it again. The person who said, let there be light, was Jesus. Nobody impressed? <laughs> Are you following what I'm trying to tell you? The man who died on that cross was the one who said, let there be light. I had two amens anymore? Okay. <laughs> You're not impressed at all that Jesus Christ is the creator. <laughs> Take away that office, he cannot be savior. He had no sin. When he made Adam and Eve, they were made in his image sinless. Now, since Eden will be restored and we will live in a world that's sinless again, God needs to put in the second Eden sinless people. As he put in the first. When God made the world the first time, he placed in charge sinless people. He gave dominion to sinless people. When the new world is made, he will give dominion to sinless people. But they have to be sinless now. Back then, he made the world first. Then made Adam. Are you with me? This time, he'll make us first. Then make the new world. You and I are on this earth to glorify the name of God. Because God's name has been sullied. 
and muddied by a false claim from Satan, which means in a very concrete sense, every choice, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, we have a, a perspective under which we study God's word, and that perspective is called what? Three words, come on. The great controversy. Everything you and I do falls on one side or the other of the great controversy. This is a struggle between right and wrong, righteousness and sin personified in Christ and Satan. And Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. Every choice I make, I'm not saying every mistake I made, I leave God. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying an individual choice can advance the kingdom of Satan. When Peter said to Christ, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee, he was trying to stop Jesus from going to Calvary. Jesus rebuked the devil. In those 10 or 5 seconds, Peter was advancing the cause of Satan. I said in those 5, 10 seconds that it took him to say, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. He was an instrument of Satan. That's why Jesus turned and said, get thee hence or get thee behind me, Satan. When Eve came to Adam with that, Apple, as we tend to say. She was an agent, finish my words, of Satan. Let me digress. In five seconds, you can be an agent of the devil to mislead one of your classmates. In five seconds. That's why we have to be connected and, and in contact with God moment by moment. Listen to Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page 324, paragraph 1. We may leave off many bad habits. For a time, we may part company with Satan. But without a vital connection with God, through surrender of ourselves to him, moment by moment. Moment by moment. That's what God needs. We shall be overcome. Without a personal, a personal acquaintance and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. Peter, for, for, some, for, for a moment, lost that contact. And in that moment of loss, he tried to get Christ to not go to Calvary. Eve, in a few moments, seconds, or minutes, however long it was, tempted her husband to sin. I say again, it only takes a few seconds to mislead someone. Those few seconds may be someone watching you for five seconds to see how you're dressed. And then goes off and wants to dress the same way. Perhaps the person will never see you again. But what he or she has seen remains and the person wants to copy it. I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, we must do what is right in the sight of God moment by moment. This is why we're on the earth. A young boy wrote me this week. He said, he said, I'm having a struggle I'm str as I try to be perfect. <laughs> I, so I wrote back and said, you're expending energy in the wrong direction. Don't try to be perfect. Try to hold on to Jesus. L.Y. says, uh, Christ doesn't call the disciples to bear fruit. He calls upon them to abide. Are you with me? John 15, let's go there quickly, then I'll close. John 15, reading from verse 1. Our subject for his purpose. When you leave tonight, I want you to understand clearly why you're alive. John 15, reading from verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Pause at 3. Here's your assignment now. Find out for me how many times you see the word abide between verses 4 and 10. Are you with me? How many times do you see the word abide between verses 4 and 10 of John 15? Let's read. Abide in me. Now keep a count. And I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me he can do nothing. 
If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciple. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Stop. Give me the results of your assignment. How many times? You're both wrong with a capital W. You must read microscopically. Read verses 4 to 10 again and tell me how many times you see abide. You have 15 seconds to read it. I'll keep quiet. How many? How did you come up with 10? The word continue is the same thing as abide. Same Greek word meno. But I would have been satisfied with nine, but it's actually ten. In verse nine, the word continue means abide. Just a variation in the expression. Ten times Jesus says what? Abide. Come on. Abide. Come on. Abide. Give me a synonym for abide. Another word means the same thing. What? Continue. Give me another word. Remain. Give me another word. Four letters. S-T-A. How many clues do you need? Y. Stay. Now, that's where we fall. So I told that young man, don't try to be sinless today. Try to, come on, abide. And Christ will produce what you cannot. When you attach a branch to a main trunk, it is what flows through the main trunk that flows into the branch. I didn't say that clearly. It's my fault. Let me rephrase my thoughts. If you're a gardener, what's the word when you attach a branch to a, what's it called? Um, graft, uh, we have a genius on the left. Grafting. Whatever that branch produces is a result of the work of the trunk. Are you with me? The trunk produces the nutrients the branch needs to produce fruit. It works spiritually. When you connect to Christ, whatever flows through Christ flows through you. Now hold on to your seats. What kind of life flows through Christ? Eternal life. Give me another word. What kind of life? What kind of power flows through Christ? Everlasting. Okay, everlasting life. What kind of power? Starts with a D, then an I, then a V, then an I. Divine power. Then what power flows through you? Because that's the only power that can conquer sin. Did you hear what I said? The only power that can conquer sin is divine power. That's why we read in Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 36, 27, I will cause you to walk in my statue. You can't do that. How can a carnal person keep a divine law? I will do that. But you must surrender to me. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Finish it for me. For his name. But he does the leading. What did Jesus say in the very first promise of the Bible? And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. You can't do it. What's our subject? What's that purpose for which we're on this earth? The glory of God. In how many areas? Give me an area. Too slow, that side. Give me one, give me one, that side. Eating, drinking, dressing, come on. What? You're in another zip code, I can't hear you. What do you say? Academic, yes. Give me another one. Conversation, come on. What? Relationships, yes. Sleeping, no. Over here. <laughs> Walk, okay. <laughs> Lady said sleeping. <laughs> Hygiene. <laughs> Recreation. Exercise, music, work, spending your money, romance. Give me the one exception. There isn't. <laughs> Whether they're for ye, come on, eat, come on, or drink, come on, or whatsoever ye do, do all 
to the glory of God. Because this is our purpose on this earth. Now, what do you plan to do when you graduate? Do you have any idea? Yes, yes. Medical missionary pilot. All right. What about you? College to study what? Why? Oh, you like it. That's your reason. I thought you'd say I can, I can glorify God with education, but you like it. Okay, God bless you with your selfish reason. Okay, now somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. What, are you, what do you plan to do in college? Come on, raise a hand. Who? Yes. Whatever God wants, we got to help him. You know, God gave you a mind. He gave you talents. Anybody? Yes. Music, why? Are you saying that because of the sermon? Okay, all right, okay, okay. One more. What will you do in college and why? Yes. Continue the mission. Is there a course called that in college? All right, okay. All I'm trying to tell you is this, and then I'll sit down. Whenever you make a decision about your life, think of God. Come on, first. If you do that, you will cut out many, many problems. And the ones you have will become God's problems. Because you're doing what you're doing for his glory. Let me say it again. When you think of God first, you eliminate countless problems. The ones that remain become God's problems. Because everything you do, your desire is the glory of God. What's our subject? What's that purpose? How many will say, Father, help me in all I do to think of you first? Can I see your right hand? Do you mean that? Yes or no? Stand up with me. 821. The message tonight is not a joke. That's how we ought to live. Will this please God? Will that please God? In the book, Acts of the Apostles, page 203, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes about Timothy. Timothy was a mere youth when he was chosen by God to be a teacher. Which means he was a teenager when God called him to teach. How old was Christ when he taught PhDs about the Bible? Twelve. How old was Josiah when he began to reign and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord? Eight. How many eight-year-olds are present tonight? What am I trying to say? Being young should not be synonymous with frivolity and video games and giggling 24 hours a day. Being young can mean heavy responsibilities. There are 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds running uh, nuclear submarines on the high oceans. Did you know what I said? They're operating machinery that costs billions because they have been given responsibility. They've been trusted. Expectations have been placed on them, and they have risen to the expectation. I'm looking at those of you who have God on your side. God wants you to be serious even in your youth. You see, the devil wants you while you're young, but so does God. What does God say? Remember now thy creator when thou drawest social security. When? In the days of thy youth. Because that's when the devil wants you. When you're young, you're willing to try new things. You're willing to take risks. You're trying to announce yourself, here am I in the world. Let me see where I fit. You're trying. You're trying to prove I can handle this. Don't supervise me. The devil wants you then. But God wants you then as well. I'll ask you again for another appeal. How many of you will say, Father, in all that I do, let me act as if you are controlling my life and no other power. Can I see your hand? Keep your hands up, Father in heaven. Bless those who raise their hands. Some have raised their hands in their hearts, dear God. Father, I have tried to tell your sons and your daughters, your glory is the reason why we're on this earth, they and I. If we've let you down, Father, forgive us, dear God. You're not a God to hold grudges. Forgive us and help us in everything we do, every waking moment, to be aware that your glory must be the purpose that drives us. Bless my young brothers and sisters, Father. Bless their families, I pray. Bless those among us who are not Seventh-day Adventists. We're grateful for their presence. Touch them, touch them, Father, until that happy day comes when they will be one of us. Father, keep us faithful. Post mighty angels around this campus that we may sleep in peace. Bring us back tomorrow, I pray. Watch over your people around the world, I ask. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, 
Amen and amen.